Uh, I'm Max Donath, and uh, I will be introducing a speaker today uh, in the uh, Advanced Transportation Technology Seminar Series uh, of the Roadway Safety Institute. Um, I just want to uh, take care of some bookkeeping issues. Um, for those of you who are not here in the room, if you're not here in the room, uh, note on the screen uh, that uh, when you first come on, uh, you will see a, uh, a window on your right which says waiting for the presentation to begin. Uh, there's a small there's a yellow arrow pointing to where you should be uh, clicking. And once you click there, uh, you should log in and put your name and affiliation into the bubble over there. And later on, if you have questions, uh, please type your questions into that particular window, and uh, Kelly, who's in the back of the room, will we'll read your questions uh, to our speaker today. Um, everything is uh, live and uh, today, and for the you here in the room, some of you are registered uh, for this class. If you have any questions about the class, about the credits, or anything, see me afterwards and we can talk about it. Uh, anyway, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Bert. Uh, he's a professor of economics management at the University of Minnesota Morris campus. Uh, he drove out here this morning. Uh, it takes a few hours to get here. Uh, he received his PhD at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 1999 and has been on the faculty uh, as a professor of economics uh, at the University of Minnesota Morris since then. Uh, he just recently uh, won uh, the University of Minnesota Morris uh, Faculty Distinguished Research Award in spring of this year. Uh, he has a very unusual trajectory, but he asked me not to talk about it. Uh, he will uh, he will later on as he uh, gets involved. His research areas are behavioral economics, experimental economics, and personnel economics, and the economics of the trucking industry. Uh, so without any the review. Uh, let me uh, introduce you to Professor Burks, and he will be talking about obesity and in the population of tractor trailer drivers. That, that is a presentation of the research team that I organize at the University of Minnesota Morris, the Truckers and Turnover Project. Um, and uh, we're pleased to be able to talk to you as part of the Roadway Safety Institute seminar series. Um, the paper I'm going to primarily focus on today has several co-authors, my statistics colleague John Anderson, three of my research students who were working on this project while they were undergraduates at UMM, and two MD uh, medical researchers in sleep medicine and occupational medicine from Harvard Medical School. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the uh, financial and uh, uh, other kinds of support that this project has received. Schneider National Incorporated, the MacArthur Foundation, the Sloan Foundation's Industry Studies Program, the Trucking Industry Program at Georgia Tech, and of course the University of Minnesota Morris. As usual, um, findings are the author's responsibilities and do not necessarily represent the views of any of the funders. So let me tell you how I'm going to structure the talk today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about trucking. We're going to talk trucking for a bit here. Trucking industry segments and its labor market. Trucking safety and fatigue. I'm going to give you a little background on body mass index, the measure of obesity that we're going to be using. And then I'll talk about how our study was structured and um, focus a little bit on the accident data that we're going to be using. Describe the analytic strategy and then present results and limitations of the study. And depending upon how much time we have at the end, I plan to do a little bit of preview of ongoing work, which extends this work into the area of obstructive sleep apnea. And I have a little code on why I study trucking if we have time to get there. So, truckload motor freight. What does that mean? Whoops. Well, so there are distinct market segments within the trucking industry. So let me just give you a little background so you know where we situate the drivers we are studying. First, you should know that some firms own the trucks that haul the freight. So when Walmart has a truck driving down the road that has not only a Walmart trailer, but a Walmart tractor, that's private carriage. And that's roughly speaking, rule of thumb, crudely, about half of all the trucking services provided in the US is through private carriage associated with particular industries. 
For higher carriage is when a firm specializing in providing trucking services does that for customers. So for instance, sometimes you will also see Walmart trailers going down the highway pulled by tractors with other company names on them. Those companies are providing for higher trucking services to Walmart. Now within for higher trucking, as soon as you get very much beyond about 100 miles or so, beyond uh, a big, a wide metropolitan area, the distance creates the need for specialization. Why? Well, truckers would say, because it don't pay to haul air. Well, maybe unless you are one of those uh, refrigerated, pressurized tanker companies hauling liquid air, but that's the exception that proves the rule, because essentially um, you need to take to, to make sure that the truck you're taking over longer distance is, distances is properly suited to the load you're hauling and is full, either full by weight or full by volume. So that means that there are two segments of for hire trucking that have a network organization. Parcel carriers, UPS, FedEx, the US Postal Service, Parcel Service, and less than truckload carriers. Firms like the Lakeville Motor Express, YRC. Um, parcel carriers handle small shipments, Less than truckload carriers handle middle-sized ship, middle shipments, but they have in common that they have to have a local terminal wherever they have service so they can bring in full trailer loads, separate them into pedal runs, they're called, runs that go around and deliver the small bits of freight, and then pick up small bits of freight to bring back to the terminal so they can go in full loads over the road again. Now, the reason I mention that is to contrast it with what we're looking at, which is truckload trucking, which is essentially point-to-point -point service, kind of like think if you're thinking airlines, which you might be more familiar with, think Southwest in its early days or a charter airline point-to-point -point service compared to Delta with a big hub and spoke system. So point-to-point um, -point service, the crucial economic difference between that and a network structured trucking organization is no barriers to entry, essentially zero. If you are going to be a less than truckload carrier or a parcel carrier over longer distances than around one centralized area, you basically have to create the network structure and that involves sunk costs. But a truckload business can become a trucking business without even owning a truck. You can just collect the, uh, get the authority, get an insurance certificate, get a phone, solicit some freight and subcontract it to all the other small trucking companies running around there until you have enough cash flow to have your own trucks. Consequence, the form of competition in these segments is different. In network structured parts of the industry, the competition is strategic competition, um, kind of like a modest form of branding, you know, Sony versus uh, Samsung. Uh, but in the truckload business, it's price competition. And there's thousands of small firms, we'll see how many in a moment, there are some very big ones, but they all are roughly on an even footing in terms of competitive power and the pricing is set by whoever, ha whoever has the cheapest uh, ability to move freight, that sets the pricing for everyone. Now, the implications of all that, why did I spend time giving this background? Because it affects the labor market, and we're looking at truck drivers. Parcel and less than truckload, because they have entry barriers and because they have more stable competitive structures, tend to have better working conditions and better wages. Truckload has very high turnover. How high? We'll take a look at the numbers on the screen here. Our, a lot of our data is from the period of 2005 through 2008. So in 2007, the American Trucking Association reported from their survey of carriers that small truckload carriers had an 82% annualized turnover rate, large carriers 112%. Oh, and the LTL firms were down about the uh, typical type for, for blue collar jobs for that time period, uh, 10 to 20%. This truckload segment emerged in its present form in deregulation, uh, after deregulation in 1980. It's had this high turnover setup ever since. The ATA survey has had the same kind of numbers since the 1990s. The, the low in the middle of the Great Recession was in uh, 2010, 39% annual average rate of turnover when nobody could get a job, right? Um, it's now back to over 100% a year. This is a secondary labor market. By the way, why does it work that way? Well, it works that way because there are three costs to effective truckload labor. You can pay money to, uh, to have drivers, uh, because drivers turn over, you can pay extra wages to keep them there, and you can pay a productivity cost by getting them home all the time and giving them better working conditions. And the thing is, these all trade off against each other, and the question is, what is the least cost mixture? And the history of the industry tells us it is low productivity costs, run the heck out of the trucks, modest wage cost, if the drivers last for a year or two, then they work up to a fairly reasonable wage, but before, no, it's low, and high turnover. Whenever demand increases, like it's doing right now for freight services, 
The turnover rate is the buffer in the system. It's spiking right now because with a competitive industry and thousands of small firms, it takes time for freights to adjust up when demand goes up. And what happens in the meantime? Wages don't go up and the turnover rate spikes. And then it comes back down after time. Okay, how big is this part of the industry that we're going to be studying? Well, the 2012 economic census numbers for trucking haven't been released yet. So this is 2007, but it's going to be similar because we had a big economic trough in the meantime. 36,600 firms is what the economic census counted back in 2007. Uh, something over $100 billion in annual revenue and essentially a bit more than half a million drivers. It's the largest single group by sort of occupational characteristics of tractor trailer drivers in the US workforce. So now let's connect this to how drivers and fatigue link to crash risk. So credible estimates of the role of fatigue in heavy truck crashes range, ones I find credible, from 7 to 20%. So if we bump that up against the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration measures, for truck-involved accidents that have uh, injuries and deaths, we get somewhere between 84,000 and 224,000 injuries, somewhere between 3,500 and 9,500 deaths over the decade. Now, the trucking industry is very sensitive about these numbers. They work very hard, at least most of them, to get safety up and accidents down. Um, and they point out the majority of crashes involving trucks are triggered by actions of the car driver, and that actually is true. It does not change the fact that fatigue reduces trucker ability to avoid crashes. And we're going to be talking about the category of preventable crashes here near the end of the talk, where that is exactly what we're talking about. Did, was the trucker able to uh, prevent the crash? What, does obesity affect that ability? So let's talk about body mass index and obesity for a moment. So what is this BMI thing? It's uh, your weight in pounds scaled by a particular factor to make it comparable in English pounds to what they do in kilograms, divided by the square of your height. The World Health Organization categorizes BMIs, 18 and a half to 25 is normal, overweight 25 to 30, obesity starts, obesity starts at 30, goes up to 35, that's class one, class two, 35 to 40, class three, above 40. Three, two and three are often called severely obese. 40 is typically by, medicine, by uh, medical professionals called morbidly obese. It's a serious medical condition. Let's just give you a flavor for what that looks like. So here for, on the left column is somebody who is 5 foot 10 inches. On the right column, somebody who is 6'2", my height. And you can see how weights translate to BMIs. If you are 5'10", 250 pounds already puts you at obesity class 2 and 300 pounds puts you way up there in obesity class three. If you are six foot two, well, you have to get up to 280 pounds before you trip over into obesity class two, but um, 310, you're almost up there to obesity class three. So that gives you the kind of flavor of what we're talking about here, because we're gonna focus especially on obesity class two and three, the severely obese. Okay, what is the prevalence of high BMI or obesity? So in 2007, 2008, which is the time period of our data, it was 34% for men and about 36% or th between 35 and 36% for women. It has been historically on an upward trend, but that upward trend interestingly appears to have leveled out somewhere around 2005 or 2006. Um, and that might be sort of good news. I mean, it's not good news for the people who are obese, but it suggests that whatever genetic predispositions are associated with the conditions of modern living that trigger this obesity, it may be that not everybody has those and that we may not be going up to 100% obesity or even 60% obesity. However, among truckers, it's bad news because not only is it a job which um, people enter with a regular rate of obesity of the population, but it's a lifestyle that is conducive to becoming obese uh, because you do a lot of sitting, you eat food that is not necessarily healthy and tends to be high calorie, um, and oh, and to make things worse medical-wise, um, you, you often don't do very much physical exercise except when for short periods you have to do very hard exercise to help unload a truck or crank a dolly or something. Okay, obesity and fatigue. Obesity is robustly correlated with obstructive sleep apnea, which is a disease that causes continual fatigue, and I'll talk a little bit more about, at the end, about that disease at the end, when, if, assuming we have time. It is also strongly associated with excessive daytime sleepiness when OSA is absence. 
It's, uh, it's absent. It is associated with many significant comor comorbidities. That's the medical term for things that go along with a particular d uh, medical condition. Stroke, heart disease, diabetes, and a bunch of others. Um, severe obesity is, in statistical terms, very bad news. The general medical view is that obesity, diabetes, and sleep disorders are all closely related. And they all, nobody knows, I mean, there hasn't been, there, there's no, as of yet, medical consensus on exactly how to disentangle the causal relationships there. But pretty much everybody thinks that the causal connections go both directions here. Okay, let's talk about our study, the new higher panel obesity study. We were collecting data in a Green Bay training school new to the industry drivers who were coming in and learning how to become uh, commercial drivers, getting their commercial driver's license and their basic training. And um, that was in the period de uh, December 2005 through August 2006. We had over 1,000 subjects, but we didn't add the height and weight questions until after we had started the study. So we have 744 with height and weight data who c were successful in completing training that we could observe for at least one week driving a tractor trailer on the road. We followed them for two years or their first exit, and there were a lot of exits, of course, because this is a high turnover segment of the industry. The company we're working with here is much better in terms of turnover rate than their peers, but they still are in a high turnover segment. A lot of exits, so whichever came first, um, the end of the observation period or first exit. And we do observe all subjects at entry into risk of having an accident. And the reason I mention that is because if we have time to talk about the obstructive sleep, obstructive sleep apnea study, a key limitation to the data analysis there is that's not true of the OSA study. This is what some of our subjects look like providing data to us in 2006. Um, they're interacting with computers on a program that is uh, controlling uh, what they see on the screen and triggering them for various kinds of responses. Let's talk about the accident data now that we're going to bump up our information about the um, uh, driver's uh, uh, um, height and weight. So we're using internal evidence from the trucking company that cooperated with this, with, uh, with this particular study, Schneider National Incorporated. Um, and that's very nice compared to government data in a number of ways. Um, there's uniform reporting standards. We don't get variations state by state in what gets reported by the police to the, up through the chain of command to the USDOT, which is a big problem with government accident data. It includes all accidents, including very minor ones. So if we are, going to, if we are willing to look at all accidents, we get a big N, which is statistically very helpful. It has a lot of information about each accident, and it's reliable at identifying actually severe accidents. Now, the firm, Schneider National, assigns potential severity categories to their accidents, which gives us an extra tool here. It essentially, uh, they are attempting to identify accidents which um, are um, likely to have severe outcomes, even if they don't actually. And so that's of managerial and public policy interest. Um, that compares to a much, that's going to give us a big N as our dependent variable compared to the smaller N for actually severe accidents. And um, although we won't get to this till the end, they also assign the industry standard status of preventable or not preventable. That's not identical with the notion of at fault legally. It's a standard that's promulgated by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And basically the intuition you should have is, could and should the driver have taken actions that would have reduced or eliminated the chance of the crash? That is a crash that's preventable. If the driver could not or should not have done those things, then it's not preventable. Now, the actually severe accidents we'll examine are those that must be reported to the Department of Transportation. And they must satisfy one of three conditions. This is indus trucking industry standard. An involved vehicle must be towed from the scene, or an involved person must receive medical treatment away from the scene, or there was a fatality. Any of those trigger DOT reporting. Thankfully, these are low incidence events. But that makes them hard to study statistically. So we will focus primarily on larger accident categories. Uh, well, I should say as well. You'll see that when we look at the small n, we're not getting very much. But we do have a way to link the two. And I'll talk about that near the end. So just to give you a flavor of what these potentially severe things are, there's four levels of potentially severe in the categorization system used by the firm. So you see the fives. Um, remember, there's 744 drivers here, 435 accidents, nice, more than half. The drivers might have had an accident if they had one, one each, right? Well, that's because they're, they're pretty small things, including fender benders and cracking a mirror and so on, 81%. The 15s, um, 78 of them, 14%. Um, so the, the ones that are of more interest, 30s and 50s, are really only 5% of all the accident total. Um, so that's good news because we're out there driving next to these guys, right? Um, uh, it's not so good news for statistical analysis, but we'll see how we address that. 
Just to give you a flavor for what these are, the low category accidents, damage the equipment, hit a fixed object like, like bump the wall of a, of a dock while you're backing in with your mirror. Um, the 30 level accidents, which are the ones that are the first level of being fairly severe, forced vehicle number two off the road, forced off the road by vehicle number two, jackknifed, hit an object, it's overturned. So these get to be pretty serious. And in this particular data set, we had only one class 50. There are all kinds of things that involve fatalities. And this was hit pedestrian. OK, yeah, <laughs> that would be serious with a 80,000 pound uh, tractor trailer. OK, so BMI and crash risk. How did we analyze it? So our strategy is we're going to take three statistical approaches. Each has a different susceptibility of potential confounding. And each uses different implicit statistical assumptions. Our question will be, do they all tell a consistent story? Because if they do, given the different ways we're coming at the problem, we're then confident of our results. And the preview is, yes, they do. What are the approaches? We're going to use a descriptive statistical comparison that's very robust and very simple. It's potentially confounded, though, because we're simply going to compare accident rates per 100,000 miles across obesity classes and suppose that the exposures to accident risk are different across those classes for something related to the way work gets assigned. Um, we have, for instance, two different types of work, solo driving on random dispatch and dedicated driving solo, but where you have more regular routes. And we'll see later on that has, they have significantly different um, accident exposure uh, relationships. Well, if severely obese people were, morally, were, were more highly prevalent in one of those than in another, it could make these results confounded. So to address that, we're going to use two multivariate regression techniques, a Poisson count model. And that basically take, means we take our data, which is actually about what happens to drivers over time from the company's operational and human resource records, and we're going to accumulate it up to one observation per driver. And we're going to enter a number of control variables there. I'll talk about what they are a little bit later. Um, and um, those control factors then let us uh, be confident that we are at least accounting for some of the potential confounds. It's not quite as robust as a straightforward descriptive statistical comparison because it depends upon some specific uh, distributional assumptions, such as the dependent variable following up on distribution. Uh, assumptions we test, but still, um, you know, think of this as you've got the magnifying glass, You've got the um, optical microscope, and then when we bring out the Anderson-Gill model, we got the, we got the electron microscope. And if they all tell us the same thing, we're in good shape. But the, m the second one and the third one involve auxiliary hypotheses of various kinds, which could be sometimes wrong in order for us to, in terms of how we interpret the data they give us. So the, second, the, the third multivariate approach is the Anderson-Gill model. And this uses the full array of our data, one observation per driver per week, we're going to have time to a crash as our dependent variable. Um, and repeated crashes are allowed. And that happens in our data set because we have so many small crashes. Um, and we're going to add a whole bunch of extra controls compared to Poisson, namely all the ones that can vary by time. What was your work assignment this week? How many miles did you have this week, as opposed to Poisson, which uses uh, cumulative miles over the, the whole period of observation? Um, so we'll see details about this in a moment. But this gives you, I think, the flavor of the three approaches. So what are the controls we're uh, introducing here? In the Poisson model, we have individual demographics, gender, age at higher, race, ethnicity. And we have some measures of risk exposure. Total cumulative miles, most frequent type of work, and home terminal location are examples. There's actually a few more, but that gives you the flavor. When we look at the Anderson-Gill model, we're going to add, keep those same demographics, gender, age at higher, race, ethnicity. But now we're going to add things like miles per week, type of work this week, and home terminal location this week. Although home terminal, terminal location doesn't change very often. It, it does change some. But miles per week, type of work per week, number of trips this week, those change all the time. OK, well, now we're ready for some results. Here's our first table. So what you're seeing across the top is categories of crashes. And you'll observe that we have the number of crashes in each category is the first. So we have, we have three, big, whoopsie, three big columns here. DOT reportables, moderate to severe crashes, that's our potential severity categories, and all crashes. And within each big uh, column, we have two sub-columns, the number of crashes and the crash rate per 100,000 miles. So if you look down the column and observe the number of crashes, you see DOT reportable is pretty rare. 
moderate to severe crashes are more numerous. And when we bring in all the crashes, including the tiny ones, we get lots of crashes. Now, what we're doing is we're comparing the rate per 100,000 miles to that across the top row, which is those who are normal, BMI of 18.5 to 25.0. You see for DO2 reportables, it's 0.16. And for uh, obese class 2, it's like 0.12. That looks smaller. And for obese class, um, uh, excuse me, that was 3. For obese class 2, it's 0 .30, uh, 0.309 or 0 .30 or 0 0.31. That looks a lot bigger. But the problem is there's just a bunch of noise there. There's a lot of variation. Those two things are not statistically different from the 22 crashes or the 0.16 that we have up on the normals. If we look at moderate to severe crashes, we see, oh, let's see, 65, 55, 36, oopsie. Um, 18, etc. Okay, what are the crash rates? Well, okay, I lost my cursor here. Where'd it go? There it is. 0 0.45, 0 0.35, 0 0.39. Oh, and it looks like it's popping up again for the last two categories. 0 0.58, 0 0.48, almost 0.49. But again, not statistically significantly different from that for normals. But if we include all crashes, then we see that there are statistically different results. The crash rates are higher because there's a lot of little fender benders, right? 1.4 roughly, 1.45 roughly, 1.45, uh-oh, 2.2 about, and 1.9. And those are statistically significantly different. This at the 10% level, uh, this at the 5% level, this is the 10% level. So that's our first indicator that obesity is associated with crash risk. All right. Now we're going to look at the Poisson model. And the baseline risk of a crash is going to be that of the normal group, the reference category, which we're going to normalize to 1. The independent variables, the covariates, control for the effects of potentially confounding differences across obesity groups, as I've explained. We're going to give estimated rate ratios results, and you think of these as multiplicative factors. They multiply the baseline rate of the reference group. So if we see a rate over 1, that's raising risk. At 1, it's no effect, and below 1, it's lowering risk. So here's what it looks like. Poisson results. So now, whoopsie. I'm not going to give you the ends again. We're just going to look at the um, regression results. So um, normals are the reference category. Overweight, well, it looks like maybe a little bit less accident risk, but not statistically significantly different. Obese class 1, a little higher. Obese class 2, a little higher than that. But again, not statistically, di uh, not statistically different for DO2 reportables. So hints, but nothing statistically uh, valuable here. Moderate to severe crashes. Well, geez, you know, it's hard to say 0.96, but 1.2, you know, maybe there's a hint there, certainly for the obese class 2 and 3. Oh, and we've grouped the obese class 2 and 3 together now. There's a hint there, that's for sure, but again, not statistically different. Okay, but now if we look at all crashes, and using a Poisson model, we account for all the potential confounding effects of different distributions of these control variables, exposures across the categories. Now we get something fairly powerful. It's about 1, it's about 1.55 times the baseline risk, and that is statistically significant at the 1% level. So that is a fairly strong finding. Again, only for all crashes, but solid, and it says about 55% increase in accident risk. Okay, let's look at the, um, at the uh, time to event model, the Anderson-Gill model. It's a semi-parametric model. The baseline hazard of exit Semi-parametric means that the baseline hazard of exit is not forced into any specific functional form. It's determined freely by the data. That permits the time path of exit risk to be flexible if necessary, to follow whatever is the actual path of the data generation process, the experience of drivers on the road. But the independent variables then shift the baseline hazard up and down. And the risk ratio results we're going to show are like the uh, rate ratios we showed. Uh, one over one raises the risk. At one has no effect. Lower than one lowers the risk. And let me show you. I put this out of the in the in the wrong order. This is the baseline risk of having any accident in this model, and you'll see it's weeks of tenure on the bottom, and it's the baseline hazard function. It's the instantaneous rate of accidents at any given week, given that you didn't have an accident. Well, actually, we have repeated accidents at any at any uh, given week. So. We're up at about 2% here, spikes at the beginning. That's when the driver has been through all his training and the training engineer is stepping out of the truck and slams the door and says, OK, bud, you're on your own. Um, that scares a few people, and there's a higher incidence of, of accident risk. And it drops, you notice, very sharply. And two things are going on there, of course. One thing is drivers who have very severe 
preventable accidents get fired. And drivers who don't get fired learn how to drive more safely. Um, out there practicing with us, actually. OK, so let's look at what this looks like. Oh, I should notice, I said um, um, the uh, covariates uh, control for potentially confounding factors. And in both the Poisson model and the Anderson-Gill model, time to event model, several covariates have statistically significant and practically large coefficient estimates, uh, big enough to, to matter. That's why we see things sharpen up when we put the multivariate models into, into play. Um, here's an example from the Anderson-Gill model before we look at the final results. So this depicted as a cumulative hazard prediction from the Anderson-Gill model shows you the different accident risk, risk, risk trajectories drivers are predicted to have when they have three distinct work types. So on the bottom, we have teams, drivers who are driving together, two people in the truck. And observe that over about its tenure time in weeks, so this goes out to about two years, out to about two years, the, the cumulative expected um, risk of an accident for a team driver who stays that long with the company is approximately, oh, it looks like viable, about 40%. This is all accidents, of course, remember, including all the minor ones. But if you look at somebody who is a um, dedicated driver driving by themselves, it's higher. Dedicated drivers are by themselves, but they have somewhat regular routes, not completely, but partially. And solo system drivers, those are the guys who bounce around the countryside like ping ball, pinballs, it's double the accident risk accumulated up over, over two years. So punchline of all this is the covariates matter. Doing the multivariate models is important. We do want to use all three approaches to understand what we're seeing here. So now let's go to the Anderson-Gill results. So this is kind of the punchline of the paper. If we look at all crashes, we observe that the normal folks have, they're our reference category, and they have 190, whoopsie, They have 195 events. Overweights have 217 events and are predicted to be uh, slightly riskier than the normal group. And where did my cursor go again? Dang it. There it is. But it's not statistically significant. Obese class 1 predicted to be slightly riskier than the normal group, 100, uh, 127 events. But again, not nearly statistically significant. But take a look at obese class 2 and 3. 1.432, uh, or about 43% increase in risk. Probability level for type 1 error there, less than 1%. Strong result. And now, here's the sort of the capstone. Among all the crashes, we're going to separate out the preventable ones. The ones that fatigue, for instance, or obesity could potentially directly affect. That is, the ones in which driver behavior is a potentially much larger factor than any arbitrary, I mean, in a non-preventable crash, we don't know that that, that, that distinction, preventable, non-preventable, is made exactly, but you certainly think that non-preventable crashes, driving behavior didn't enter in as much. Preventable ones, it does. What do we get? 1.54 approximately. Again, p-value less than 1%. That's a pretty strong finding. It says that approximately 54% higher risk of a preventable crash for severely obese drivers. And it follows the pattern of the earlier two results, the descriptive results and the Poisson model results. Now, here's what it looks like in terms of one of those cumulative hazard graphs. If we look, I have here normals are the folks on the bottom here. Oops, see, keep doing that. Normals are the folks on the bottom right there. Uh, people who are... Um, Slightly, dang, I'm not trying to do that, but it keeps doing it. Slightly obese um, is the next group up, and the severely obese, 35 to 40, to, to, to get the eyeball, the interocular um, uh, impression effect here. Uh, I, I left out the in-between group so you can see how big the gap is. It's, it's basically, it's a gap in predicted cumulative risk that's similar to the difference between team driving and solo system driving, and it's a pretty big effect. Now, limitation of this study is because even when we're looking at preventable crashes, we have a lot of small crashes in there. And small crashes are not inherently 
of great public policy or managerial concern. I mean, they are of some concern, but, but they're small. So how do we connect these, this, this broader accident category or the small crashes to crashes that are of more public policy concern? Well, the answer is that in our data, we observe a number of drivers who have more than one accident. And that's possible because a lot of the accidents are small. And if you have small early accidents, you don't get fired. So what we do is we take our Anderson-Gill model. We run exactly the same models we did before to give you that 1.53 p less than or p equal to 0 0.007. And we add a new independent variable. Did you have a prior accident of any severity? And we um, take the dependent variable, our three different categories. And what we find when we look at the potentially severe and the DUT reportable is that we get between 15% and 18% increase of risk of a later accident that is more severe if you have a prior accident of any type. So there is a linkage between the finding we have for all preventable accidents and accidents that are of significant concern to managers and the public. So what's the summary of this? Obesity class two and up have significantly higher risk with our controls for various potential confounding factors approximately 50% higher of a preventable accident of any potential severity level and direct evidence of more severe accidents is similar, especially for the top obesity groups, but it's not statistically uh, significant. It, the point estimates generally point in that direction, but we don't have a big enough end to be able to say that it's real evidence. However, because we can connect lower severity preventable accidents or lower severity accidents to, actually it's preventable accidents we use, to the risk of a later more severe preventable accident, we can say that there is a linkage between this broad accident category and the more serious ones. So that's the primary punchline of the BMI and accident risk or crash risk paper. Now, you might well ask, what is, oh, and here's the reference for it. This is the paper. It was published in Accident Analysis and Prevention in 2012. You might well ask, what is the mechanism for this obesity and accident risk connection? And you remember I started out by saying, well, we know that obesity is associated with excessive daytime sleepiness independently of obstructive sleep apnea. We know it's also strongly associated with obstructive sleep apnea, and obstructive sleep apnea is pretty nasty. So that's where we're going in our extension work, which is ongoing now, which I will preview very briefly. This is work also in collaboration with the Harvard Medical School folks and Virginia Tech Transportation Research Institute. Precision Pulmonary Diagnostics, which is doing the obstructive sleep apnea testing program for Schneider National and Schneider National. And um, let's ask, what is obstructive sleep apnea? So it's a disease in which your airway relaxes and closes while you're sleeping, and your respiration is halted. Now, this happens while you're sleeping, so you don't actually know it occurs. Most people who have this don't know they have it. But what happens is your brain partly wakes up to reopen the airway. And that spikes your stress hormones. It spikes your blood pressure. Um, it means that the sleep process by which you go into deep restorative sleep is disrupted and never fully occurs. If this happens more than five times per hour, you are described clinically as having mild obstructive sleep apnea. More than 10, 10 times per hour, or some, some uh, clinicians use 15, it's definitely um, diagnosable obstructive sleep apnea. And it's associated, as I said, with excessive daytime sleepiness, hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and something like, I, I, I should have put this slide in, I should have pulled it out, but it's, it's something like 75% or 80% of people who are severely obese, class two and three, have obstructive sleep apnea. And the reason is because of excess tissue in the neck. Now, people without obesity also can have this disease if you have a genetic predisposition towards it. I have a colleague at Morris, a fellow faculty member, who tells me that six years ago when he got diagnosed and began wearing his CPAP treatment machine, it changed his life. And he's a skinny guy. So it's not just people who are obese, but it's strongly connected with obesity. What's the prevalence of this? It's expected to uh, apply to about 4% of all middle-aged men in the U.S. A national football study found that about 34% of randomly, te randomly tested linemen had obstructive sleep apnea. About 70 to 80% of a severely obese individuals. It's estimated the prevalence is pretty high among truck drivers. I think I put 20 to 30% here. I think there's actually a more recent higher estimate of prevalence. 
If you are an auto driver in the gender population, having this disease untreated is associated from, depending on the study, between 2 and 11 times the risk of having a car crash. There is a gold standard treatment, which for most people relieves the symptoms. It's called a continuous positive airway pressure. It's a machine you wear with a mask. You wear it at night. It pressurizes your airway, and you don't have your airway collapse. But it can be hard to get used to. One of the problems with this treatment is that many people start it and never complete it. They give it up because it's hard to adapt to. Now, Snyder National, as a, industry, as a safety leader in the trucking industry, began using a screening questionnaire to screen their drivers in 2006. And when they found people who were at high priority for a diagnosis because they screened as maybe as possibly uh, susceptible to OSA, they sent them for uh, overnight polysomnogram diagnosis diagnoses, and if they were diagnosed positive with this disease, they were required to accept treatment and to be successful at treatment in order to continue employment. And success was monitored using the electronic um, uh, record keeping uh, functions of the continuous positive airway machine. It was covered, and, and this treatment was covered as preventive medicine with no out-of-pocket expense to drivers on Schneider's uh, employee health care plan. Now, the problem we face in doing this analysis and analyzing the OSA study is that the tenure, we don't observe everybody coming into this population um, when they enter accident risk. In the BMI study, we observe people right when they start work. In the OSA study, we observe people who, when they started the program, were diagnosed and tested, and it, uh, te uh, screened and then diagnosed uh, uh, and then uh, got treatment. And, and, and there's a considerable lag, especially when the program was first starting, between um, people starting work on average, and getting diagnosed and treated. It's much less now that the program's going for a while, but we're looking at the early data. So basically, we find um, that people in the diagnosed group have a higher than average tenure than the population. And if you survive on this job, it means you didn't have a severe preventable accident. So what we're looking at, accident risk, the dependent variable, is partly responsible for who gets into the population that we can study. That's a problem. So we end up using a case control approach. We can't compare OSA diagnosed drivers with the rest of the population. We have to compare OSA diagnosed drivers with people who have similar experience at higher and similar job tenure on the week that the case got diagnosed. And that's a big complicated process, which I'm not going to go into here. It's, an, it's a whole other talk, maybe next year. Um, but a preview of results is that we are finding some very large and sti very statistically significant results. Crash risk for drivers with treated versus untreated OSA is quite different. Um, this work is going to be extended to look at the medical conditions and medical insurance costs that are associated with different OSA statuses from the Roadway Safety with support from Roadway Safety Institute. So my picture on that is, or my, my story on that is, stay tuned. And then here's my little coda. Why do I study trucking safety? Well, portrait of the speaker as a young man. This is me in 1977 and 1983. I started out studying philosophy in graduate school. I'm from an academic family. My dad was a history professor. But I dropped out after three years of doctoral study to drive tractor trailers. The big rigs called. The effect of that was that I lived through economic deregulation, which happened in 1980. So that's where all that trucking econ stuff comes to the beginning, because I went back to school and retooled from scratch, learned the math, learned the econ, and then went off to a doctoral program so I could figure out what happened to the trucking industry when I was there. But the safety connection is this. See that truck there on the right, Helms Burns Express? Through the front windshield of that truck with my little pocket 110 cartridge camera, you know, this is before cell phones and digital cameras, right? 1983, we didn't even have, well, I bought my first personal computer in 1986, right? So it's, for you guys, this is history. This is a picture I took. Going down Snowshoe, the longest downgrade east of the Rockies on I-80 in the winter. We call this skiing on 18 wheels. And um, from a little bit different part of the road, not too far away, here's what happens if you don't do it right. And luckily, there were no cars crushed in this particular accident. So that's why I study trucking safety. I've been there, and I've done that, and this is a topic that is near to my heart. And that's the end of my presentation. So I think we're ready for some questions. Road and snowshoe pen in the winter, but not as a trucker. <laughs> <laughs> but still, keep going. Uh, I've done the driving down to the Mayo.
too. <laughs> it's been out a few times. And the, um, this is on. Uh, are there any questions here? Again, for the people who are not here, uh, we need to have you use the microphone. Anyone have any? Anyone here have any questions? Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Sure. Um, do you, when you interview these drivers, do you ever check what they do with their off time? Uh, because clearly, if they are not getting sleep when they're off duty, uh, they aren't doing themselves or anyone a favor. I think there recently there have been a number of crashes. Uh, trainers, uh, and they uh, found out what they were doing in their off time. I mean, they were partying and doing all sorts of interesting things, certainly not getting the sleep they're supposed to. And, um, in fact, um, you might be thinking of the uh, recent incident where um, a Walmart driver rear-ended the van hauling Tracy Morgan, Absolutely. killing a colleague and injuring him, and it turned out that um, he'd been driving for about six or seven hours, eight hours coming up from Atlanta, but he'd been awake for something like almost 24 hours, uh, or I think it was a total of 24 hours at the time he hit him, but uh, for a long time before that because he had actually commuted to his home terminal from three or 400 miles away from there and hadn't been to sleep uh, because of family things before leaving on that commute. So he you know, did stuff at home, commuted to his job, got in the truck and started driving, and legally from logbook regulations, from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration hours of service regulations, he was legal, but he wasn't safe. And that is a significant problem. Um, the Federal Motor uh, Carrier Safety Administration has actually been tweaking in various ways over the last few years the hours of service regulations. The trucking industry is you know, very interested in those details. And some things they think are OK. They don't like some of the others. And, and sometimes they have basis for that, sometimes not. It depends on the, on the particular issue. But nobody has, as far as I know, a direct way to deal with what drivers do in their off time because, I mean, uh, you know, this is. Um, this is the United States of America, and you know, uh, when you're employed, your employer is entitled to have some control over what you do on the job. But when you're off the job, you know, I mean, there are things you can't do if you're a truck driver off the job. You can't go use drugs because if they test you later and find that you have been, you can be discharged. Should there be such a regulation about sleep? Well, the problem is, how would you ever make that sensible and, and enforceable? And you know, how would it not be a, a horrible intrusion on people? So it's a problem. Do I have an answer? I do not. Have I studied that particular question? No, I haven't, but people have. Over the years, there have been uh, folks who have been working on fitness for duty testing. Uh, in other words, while you're driving, uh, run, through, run you through some paces uh, to see if you really have your mind uh, focused on the driving task. Uh, have well, you come across anything? You, you, you make a very excellent point because that, if, if there is a way forward on the question of how fit for drivers for duty at a given time when they're driving, it's the, um, the live or periodic uh, monitoring while on the job. And, and there are companies experimenting with that. There are technology companies working on devices that do that. Uh, and that is something we could see within the foreseeable future. Um, when the technology is good enough not to give false positives or false negatives, and when it's inexpensive enough to effectively implement, and when the federal government says that you should do it. Although some firms will probably implement it beforehand if they feel it's effective. I don't want to uh, be the only one asking questions. Anyone else? This doesn't just affect the trucking industry. Um, uh, clearly, uh, Train operators, uh, there were several recent announcements by the National Transportation Safety Board regarding uh, commuter rail out in New York uh, where the uh, rail uh, I, I think the details, operator. if I remember, you sent me that story. Yeah. And I had already seen the original story a couple of years ago. The investigation just right. concluded. But the operator on a Metro North uh, commuter train um, dozed off and uh, went around a corner, a curve, that had a 35 or 40 mile an hour limit at 80 miles an hour. The train derailed and seriously injured several people and killed one or two, I yeah, believe, didn't it? Yeah, right. And, um, and it turned out that he had undiagnosed sleep apnea, according to the National Transportation Safety Board report that was just related, uh, released. It was NTSB, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, NTSB. Reported this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it just um, released it uh, this last week. And um, that's, you know, uh, that's n not um, an isolated finding. Um, uh, I, I think the big question in trucking about to what extent will obstructive sleep apnea screening be done, 
depends in part on the results of studies like the one we're working on now. Because, um, you know, actually severe accidents are statistically rare events, even though they are of real concern to all of us. They are statistically rare events. It's hard to establish what factors affect their incidence in a scientifically credible way, and in particular because of the issue of the fact that most truck drivers don't want to self-report any medical condition that could limit their employment opportunities unless you have something like the program that Schneider has running. It is very difficult to collect actual data on what people with and without treated obstructive sleep apnea or with treated and untreated obstructive sleep apnea do crash-wise in a truck. So, um, you know, we're certainly hoping that the study we're working on now, when it is, uh, when it is uh, accepted at a journal, will have some impact on that debate. Are other trucking companies interested? Well, so it varies a lot in the industry, um, but certainly some others are. So other firms that have made it public that they are uh, at least um, experimenting with obstructive sleep apnea programs would include uh, J.B. Hunt, which is another big truckload carrier, or big in intermodal services. Um, and there are some of the private carriers who have uh, publicly announced that they are uh, experimenting with such programs. But it's not widely or fully adopted in the industry. And if you stop and think about the truckload industry, how I described it at the beginning, 36,000 firms and maybe a couple hundred are big ones. The rest are all small. 50 trucks are smaller. Probably three quarters of them are two or three trucks. Can you imagine if you're running a little family business like that, you know, how could you invest in doing obstructive sleep apnea stuff? You know, I mean, it would just, it would seem like a mountain. You couldn't climb both, both in terms of how to do it and in terms of cost unless everybody had to do it, and therefore freight rates were going to change to reflect that fact, and then you might be able to. So that's why regulation, if we establish this relationship, is pretty important. Any other questions? If not, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Burks for his uh, interesting talk. My Thank pleasure, you. Max. Okay. Thank you. So, are you going to shut down the area closer? Yeah. Okay. I'll take my. Uh